you know, I like to brag on this podcast from time to time that we often give players or teams a boost by talking about them. We make a mention, all of a sudden they go and have themselves a great week. But I think if I'm going to brag about that, I have to admit to the opposite as we begin this week's episode, because last week, Dan Mahar and I were talking about the Sudbury Wolves pumping a whole lot of air into those Nickel City tires. And what do we have this week? The Ontario Hockey League's own version of Bounty Gate. Here we go, Dansky. What say you about the allegations that the Ontario Hockey League is now looking into? Well, I mean, allegations of a bounty are pretty serious. You, 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 the thinking being that obviously someone from a dressing room would have leaked some information that there was a bounty on another player's head. If that happens in any context, obviously it's completely unacceptable. It's egregious. It's caused for people to be booted right out of the league, really, especially if it comes from an adult, like a coach, assistant coach, you name it. Having said that, I want to be very careful here because sometimes – allegations can be completely false sometimes allegations could be somewhat stretched it could just be you know players have heard around the boards that that the team's going to be looking for a guy yeah th these things happen in junior hockey for sure where a player gets a target on his back for some reason or another and talk can be misconstrued so not knowing exactly what evidence there is here what proof there is here i'll be careful to completely indict the Sudbury wolves other than to say if there indeed was a bounty or anyone verbalized a command for, for players to go after a player, then that is a, an extremely serious affair. Does your opinion, just picking up on one of the things you said, does your opinion change much if, by chance, it was not an adult, i.e. a coach or an assistant coach, that offered the alleged bounty? It changes in terms of the severity of the punishment, for sure. I don't think it changes in terms of the need for punishment, though. I think if there's a player in a room who's encouraging his teammates to go after a certain player, uh, a quote-unquote bounty. A bounty suggests there's some sort of reward for doing it, financial or otherwise. So that's that's next level. If it's that, if it's just, you know, this guy's a jerk, let's, let's, let's be physical on him, let's make him pay. That's stuff that happens all the time. So there's, I, I think there's a pretty big spectrum here, Mike, in my mind. But I think if there is someone that said, you know, let's injure this guy, let's make a, let's go after him. And if you do, here's what I'm going to do for you. That's pretty serious. So even if it's a player, I think there's got to be suspension incoming. But if it's a coach, it's, it's next level. That's, that's my thinking. I don't know where you're at on this one. Well, I'm in a whole lot of places here, if I'm being honest with you, because I think we can take this back an awfully long way to recognize, of course, that the idea of a bounty is nothing new in hockey or anywhere else, for that matter, in sport. Let me just put it that way, in sport. Heck, if we want to get into real life <laughs> outside of the sporting arena, we know that bounties actually exist, but that's a whole other story. We're going to keep this focused on what's happening in the Ontario Hockey League because, of course, this is the OHL podcast. So it just so happens coincidentally, and I'm going to use a shameless plug here, we're going to have another feature guest interview this Friday with a man who won the Memorial Cup with the Niagara Falls Flyers a way back when and was a captain of the Ottawa 67s in the pre-Brian Kilray days. So that just goes to show you how long ago this guy played in the league. And without any prompting, without me mentioning, he might have been uh, superficially aware of the Sudbury investigation, although I didn't get a sense that he was. And he told not one, but two stories that you'll hear in the podcast this coming Friday about bounties, 500 bucks and a bottle of Jack Daniels. If you do this to that player on the other team. So again, that takes us back more than half a century. And he told these stories unprompted and very willingly. And quite honestly, we had a bit of a chuckle at them all these years later. I would like to think, as I think you're alluding to here, Dan, that we have evolved in this regard, that we have moved beyond this idea. However, have we? How long ago? About a decade and a little bit, Bounty Gate rocked the National Football League, and we know what the penalties were for that. It just so happens that this past weekend was the 47th anniversary of the movie Slapshot, and I think anybody who's been around this game for more than a minute knows about the movie and probably remembers Reggie Dunlop putting a bounty on the head of Tim McCracken, the, what did he call him? The, the chief, I don't know, whatever he was with the Syracuse, you know, the head coach and chief 
muckraker with the Syracuse team. And I'm going to give a hundred bucks of my own money to anybody who quote unquote nails that guy. Didn't say injures, but goes out there and gets them. That's what Reggie Dunlop asked for. And it's not exclusive to hockey. I already made reference to Bounty Gate in the NFL with the New Orleans Saints. We can take you back to the Dick Butkus days in the National Football League. And Dick Butkus made it very clear that when he hit you, he wanted you to know that it was Dick Butkus that laid that look on you. Maybe not intending to injure, but definitely wanting to leave it there. If you want to take it back to ancient times and gladiators who, contrary to popular belief today, did not always fight to the death, a very small percentage actually died. But the idea, much like MMA in the modern day, is to get the opponent to tap out. So none of this is to excuse what's being investigated right now in Sudbury. But this has been around since competition, sports, dare I say, men versus men, because we have this testosterone thing that tends to get carried away and we're not always the best at making good decisions. And here we find ourselves. Is it egregious? Is it unacceptable? Absolutely it is. And and the precedent here, if we even just look beyond the Ontario Hockey League at what happened most recently when this came about in the National Football League, we had a head coach suspended for a year and a general manager suspended for half I'll remind you that there's currently a coach in the Ontario Hockey League who was suspended for about half a season, give or take a little more, in Greg Walters with no allegations of a bounty or anything like that. So if that was the penalty for Greg Walters, could you imagine how the league is supposed to effectively meet out punishment in this regard? I can't even imagine where it would start. Having said all of that, and I know I'm going on here, but you you go, you jump in because I got more, but that's kind of where I'm at. Just the, the idea that none of this is new doesn't make it acceptable. But I, I think we're being a little naive if we don't pause to consider the reality of this. Oh, for sure. I think the, the it has been around forever. There's no doubt about it. I think we've all been involved in teams where some of this chatter happened and it was just accepted part of everything. And you used the word evolved. And I think that's a good a word, a good word. But I think there was this false notion that somehow you're being tough or you were you, you were soft if you didn't like this concept. But whatever happened to winning within the confines of the rules? I have no issue whatsoever if you say, I want you to finish every check on this guy. He's a good player, finish every check. You know, uh you have a day off tomorrow if you guys finish every check. You're going to skate hard if you don't. That kind of thing is perfectly fine. When we start talking about going after knees, going after heads, and delivered attempts to injure, what you're telling me there is probably the least uh, manly thing, if you want to use that term. It, it's saying that you can't beat this person at the sport, so you're going to try and cheat to win this. And everything about it just rubs me the wrong way, and especially when you're talking about kids in this case. I have a problem whenever it bends the rules. So if you if you... Tell me that you're going to try and injure a guy to get him out of the game. That's a much different thing than trying to make him earn his ice out there and make him earn the win. So I think there's a very distinct line. And I and if you cross it, you cross it. And I don't think there's any place for that in any sport. So this, I think, will tie into something I want to address a little bit later in this episode of the OHL podcast when we talk about all of the suspensions that have been handed out of late. But I wonder if, just to be devil's advocate here, based on what you just talked about, if if maybe the idea was just, listen, next time we play the Barry Colts, we want Kashawn Aitchison to pay a price for what he did to Nathan Villeneuve, right? And so the story was, as we probably all know by now, there's a game between Barry and Sudbury, uh, Aitchison hits Nathan Villeneuve, your OHL, your, your prospect of the week on this podcast last week, Dan, with a clean, hard body check, has to answer the bell right away, fights Nolan Collins. And then three days later, when the teams are supposed to play again, there's no Aitchison in Barry's lineup because they had learned of the alleged bounty. They're actually playing, by the way, later this week as this episode comes out, as the Ontario Hockey League is conducting this investigation. But what if the, the quote-unquote bounty in this case was, hey, Aitchison's a target. Like, let's go make sure we make his night really difficult. I, I think, if I'm being devil's advocate here just for a moment, I think that we might we might put a little bit too much emphasis on what is said, removing any context or anything like that, and, and what, what would have been a bounty 
20 years ago is nothing close to what we consider a bounty today, right? In the Reggie Dunlop days, flout on, I'm putting a hundred bucks on for somebody that quote unquote nails that creep. I don't, I think it's possible. I think it's possible that nobody is saying that today. But again, we want to evolve. We want players to understand that and, and coaches you win within the rules of the game, et cetera. But I don't want to be involved in a game where it's not okay to make life difficult for the opposition. It's not okay to finish every one of those checks, et cetera. Any notion at all that there's an intent to injure or making somebody's life difficult is going Bobby Clark across the ankle in the Summit Series, forget it. That's a whole different concept. But I'm not sure that's what we're talking about here. Regardless, there is no winner emerging from this story. The Ontario Hockey League is still in the midst of its investigation. Whatever it concludes, I think, unfortunately, we end up with this being a narrative that currently exists in the league. And that sucks across the board. The, if the league decides there was nothing untoward that went on here, then there could be accusations that they didn't take the investigation seriously enough or they didn't probe it deeply enough. And you're going to have that side of the argument. If they do end up distributing punishment for what exactly will we ever know the answer to that? Maybe not. So have we just gotten a little bit too sensitive around language? I don't know, but there's nothing good, unfortunately, that comes of this. And speaking of evolution, haven't we just seen it recently enough in this league with the situation that ended the Burke family's involvement in St. Catharines with the Niagara Ice Dogs and a group chat that got leaked publicly. There is nothing, and I do mean nothing, that is a secret in this world anymore. You can't go to a bank machine with it being a secret. You can't go into an arena in this league with it being a secret. It's not. It's just not the way the world works. And you can be sure, people that I've talked to over the years in this game lament the loss of the good old fashioned rivalries because they say the players today, they're all too close to one another. And I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing, but they might skate together in the summer. They might work out together in the off season. They might know each other from coming up through the game. And that's why the league stepped in and started putting in rules around staged fights because kids were using social media to say, Hey, we're playing each other this Friday night. Let's arrange something, etc." They're all so closely connected that if you think that you can be in your locker room in any city in this league and say something or text it to a buddy on the team and it doesn't get back to somebody else on that other team, uh, you are playing a fool's game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well said. And, and you know, this is this is kind of uh, something where knowing where the line is on both sides is key. And false accusations are just as bad as as carrying out the act itself in, in my mind, because it cast the league the same way either way, whether there was a bounty placed or whether someone made the accusation falsely. So either way, you know where the line is. Don't accuse someone of it if you don't have evidence that it actually happened. And on the other side, obviously don't do it. If, if you're anyone who says, here is a reward for injuring a player, shame on you and shame on everything about the whole situation. So, so there's a very clear line there. And I think the point you made earlier is the key is making, making a night hard on a guy. Totally fine. We want, that's the type of physicality. It's a hard sport. If you want to say this guy's good, finish your checks, make it a hard night for him. No one has any problem with that. But the second you start offering up $500 a bottle of Jack Daniels to get a player out of the game, then I start to have a problem with it. And, but I just want to be careful too, because on the accusation side too, when you make those accusations, you're telling the league and everyone who follows it that this league has an issue with this stuff. So you better be careful with on both sides of the ledger here. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And again, it just comes back to the end of all of this. There's no winner. There's nothing good, unfortunately, that comes out of any of this. And really, it does spoil, as I alluded to at the outset, a really good story in Sudbury right now, regardless of the outcome of this investigation. Slight tangent here, but what I wanted to touch on, and I explained how this all evolved, right? Kashan Aitchison lays a good, clean, but hard body check on Nathan Villeneuve. And within that game, had to quote unquote, answer the bell. Can we just talk about this ridiculous notion about answering for a good, clean hit in this game? Like, let's get over ourselves here. And I like oh, fighting. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's it's the most ridiculous concept I've ever. It again, it to me, it comes back to poor, just being a poor sport, a poor loser. It's the same thing as saying we need to injure this guy because we can't stop him at hockey. It's the same thing with this. If a guy makes a good, clean, hard check, which is well within the rules of the game, it's part of the game, and you feel the need to make him fight, or he feels the need to have to fight because of it. What is that? That's just being a poor sport, saying we don't like being hit. We you're you're better at this than we are. So we want our pound of flesh too. Well, how about you do it legally then? How about you go out and hit them back? How about you demonstrate you can play hockey at the same level? So anyway, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think the whole notion of having to fight after a clean hit is absolutely absurd. And I think the sooner we get this out of the game, the better. So every hockey player paying attention to this, just give up on that notion. If the hit's clean, skate away. From the investigation that's ongoing in Sudbury to another Northern franchise, in fact, the northernmost in Sault Ste. Marie and Boy, oh boy, if you listened to last week's episode, not only were we pumping the tires of the Sudbury Wolves, but I just kind of randomly at the end of the episode uh, pumped out the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds as an organization, as a city to go watch a game. Uh, you can go back and listen to it if you want to. So maybe I should declare a conflict of interest on this particular part of the conversation this week. But Tucker Tynan, a uh, former goaltender with Sault Ste. Marie and Niagara in this league, has launched a $300,000 lawsuit against the Greyhounds on claims that his injury while in Sault Ste. Marie was mishandled. He was subjected to derogatory slurs, at least one of which was racist, and he was pressured to play through his injury while self medicating. It is a $300,000 lawsuit. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that the Sioux Greyhounds have come out with a statement saying they will vigorously defend themselves against these accusations and talked about the high caliber of personnel from managers on down to training staff within the Greyhounds organization. Again, I don't think I have to make my feelings known anymore on Sault Ste. Marie. I have made it clear over a number of years now how big a fan I am of the organization. Obviously, I'm not around it every day, and this is something for the courts now to sort out. But the Sault Ste. Marie organization that I have come to know and the people within the organization that I've gotten to know over various regimes, this doesn't square for me. But it's up to the courts to figure out for me. Yeah, and you obviously know the folks in that community a lot a lot better than I do, so I can only speak from a distance. But what I will say is the part that doesn't jive for me at all is one thing I do know about this league is the level of professionalism amongst the medical staffs across the league is just top notch. It's it it's incredible. You talk about the evolution of the league in the game probably as good an evolution as has occurred is in that field where we have just these terrific people working for every organization top to bottom in this league. So again, like you said, it doesn't square with me either that there would be anything untoward or malpractice or certainly nothing intentionally um, deceitful here in the whole process. So I, I, I have trouble buying that there's anything untoward here. So it was nice to see a fairly aggressive statement come back from, from the Sioux Greyhounds as well. And we'll see how this plays out in the courts, but something doesn't square with me just knowing the caliber of people we have in these fields. I think that's a really good point. And there have been in every market that I've encountered over these last many years, an abundance of caution around injuries to players to the point that fans and, you know, a lot of other people might be like, when is this guy coming back? Why is he even out of the lineup, et cetera? And they treat so much with what you might call kid gloves compared to the way it used to be tape it up and get back out there. Right. So I think you make a great point about the caliber of staff uh, behind benches, on benches with medical staff, et cetera, trainers and whatnot. The other thing I'm just going to add into this, and I will add it simply for consideration. You can draw your own conclusions, but I will I will draw a link between this particular lawsuit and the new antitrust lawsuit that came out earlier this month against the Canadian Hockey League. And really, this gets back into the weeds of whether or not it should be a unionized environment and things like that. And look, I, I'm not here to carry water for the Ontario Hockey League. I, I will tell you, if you want to make it a minimum wage job and unionize, et cetera, then the education packages come off the table. And if you're thinking about how much an education costs these days, I still think players come out of this ahead, but that's a whole sidebar. These suits, if you were to tr 
trace them back to their roots. I think it is my understanding of them and belief that you will usually find players for whom it didn't work out all that well in the league. And I'll just leave it at that. You can determine how you feel about it, but I'll just put that out there for some consideration. And I don't want to besmirch the legal profession either, but I would say some of those roots are also from people that had nothing to do with the league and saw an opportunity. Um, we've seen that in the in history with some of the talks around uni unionizing and whatnot. Some of these things stem from people that had nothing to do with playing. They just saw an opportunity to maybe make a, a little bit of a push here for, for cash or other profit. Um, so, yeah, I think sometimes when you trace it back and follow it back to the roots, it's, it sheds some light on to where these things are really coming from. So we'll let the courts sort out the Tucker Tynan versus Sue Greyhound situation. We'll let the league sort out. Uh, I, I don't like Gates, but the bounty allegations uh, between Sudbury and Barry. And we'll move on to another one of the issues we wanted to discuss this week. And that is the complete and utter lack of a shortage of suspensions. Holy moly. I will say again that I think the league has done a really good job this year in administering their decisions in a timely manner. But this is probably the loudest I've heard grumbling around the decisions of what the penalty should be for the crime on the ice, if you will. But Still, there was a pretty quick dispensing of justice. We've got Ryan McGuire of the Guelph Storm, uh, another two-game suspension for he had already exceeded the threshold for penalties to checks to the head. He had another one, so tack on another two games for Ryan McGuire. Angus McDonnell gets two games, going back to what I said earlier in the Sudbury story. Maybe McDonnell said words that, and from what I'm hearing, Nothing derogatory, racist, anything like that, but just words that were interpreted as being threatening and or bullying. He gets two games for that. If you can't tell, I'm not sure I'm okay with that. Uh, Jackson Edward, for the third time in a month, gets a two-game suspension for a check to the head. Uh, Edward, of course, of the London Knights. I should have mentioned McDonnell, of course, with Mississauga, Ryan McGuire of Guelph. Uh, Troy Mann, the, the, the head coach in in Kingston and he's only been there about half a season already suspended a second time. And it was during an eight, one romp of the front next, but man said something that got him a one game ban. Uh, Sawyer Bolton of the London Knights, a third suspension for him. And this is the one that had people talking an awful lot. It was automatically two games for instigating a fight in the final five minutes of a blowout. Nothing more was tacked onto the end of that. And you and I talked about that last week, Dan, at some length, from what I was hearing around the rinks, it would have been much longer, maybe even pushing double digits. But the league says, nope, the two games, as per the rules, is all Sawyer Bolton would get. And then Jacob Terrian continues to serve his five-game suspension for a check from behind versus Saginaw. You want to weigh in on any or all of those? <laughs> well, I guess my biggest problem is that I guess the league doesn't really believe in progressive discipline. Because we're when a player has a track record and these things start to mount up, usually you get more the second time and more the third time. And the idea is that it has to, it's not deterring you. I guess we have to tack on more until you get the message. So I have the biggest, and I'm not, not trying to pick on the London Knights here, but they happen to have two players there in Jackson Edward and Sawyer Bolton who are on their third suspension of the season. At some point, you need to up the ante here and make them understand that their actions are unacceptable. Clearly the, the one in two game suspensions aren't doing it. So where's the message that, Oh, I know I can do this again. Just get two games again. I can do this again. Just get two games. So that's my first problem with, with how this discipline is being handed out. And then the second one, just, I think you kind of touched on it, Mike was just some of the inconsistency. I, I do love that the league is quicker with suspensions this year and they're announcing them quicker, but not every action seems to have an equal reaction from the league. And some of these things you say, really, that was a suspension or there were just a few words here that were neither racist nor offensive, but they got a suspension yet checks to the head for the third or fourth time are still sitting in the one and two game range. So I, ha I have a bit of trouble with how the judgment is coming down here, but my biggest problem of course is with the progressive piece is any workplace, Mike, uh, as you know, if you're into the discipline file every uh, offense adds more to to that discipline to try and get the message across 
there has to be some sort of progressive nature to it. And I'm just not seeing that with the Ontario Hockey League right now. That's where I land on this precisely. I do think there has to be more of a deterrent and we can get into this in various walks of life. But the idea is if you really do want it out of the game, then you add progressively harsher penalties for each subsequent infraction. It, it seems pretty obvious and I don't know why it comes across as being anything but obvious to the league in terms of the way these suspensions have been meted out. I mean, you think of a, a busy month for a team in the Ontario Hockey League, you might play 12 or 13 games over the course of that month. Well, three times in that 30-ish day span, one player is getting suspended two games, so misses maybe half of those games, and also for the same infraction. Do you, do you care about it? Do you want heads protected in this league, or don't you? So I, I, I struggle a little bit with that. I don't like the... Uh, the the look the optics that's the word i'm looking for the optics that come into play here then when you know people will look at which team the player competes for and wonders if that particular team has a uh, has some influence at the league offices i don't think that's the case but gosh darn it sometimes you look around you wonder well how else do you explain two games to angus mcdonnell for saying this that or the other thing and two games to players who are already facing discipline for the third time this season. It, it, it doesn't help that narrative, but look, I I'm just going to sit back and, and take a bit of a, a backseat on this one. I think I'm developing a bit of a reputation that I don't want. I'm just here to tell you how I feel about things. I've been around this league for a lot of years and, and I'm not going to shy away from speaking my mind about what it is that I see. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it right there. But I, I do think that the, the lack of progressive penalties here uh, is, is troubling, is troubling. And I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that for this point. Yeah, troubling is a good word because I think the premise being that the league's trying to protect players. So if the thought is Angus McDonnell said something that was threatening and they wanted to send a message to him and say, well, you know, you got to sit because you're threatening a player. Well, is there not a greater threat to these players taking headshots and taking aggressive, violent headshots in the course of the game? So to my mind, your first one, sure, game or two. But when you start doing it on a repeating basis, that has to add games each time until the message has gone across. So I just struggle with that inconsistency, Mike. Like you said, it's troubling to me that if the thought is to protect your players, well... I'm a lot more concerned about a guy's elbow flying at my head at full speed than I am about someone threatening me on the ice. So let's try and get this uh, a little more correct uh, going forward because I'm not, I'm not seeing the, uh, the magnitude reflected in the crime here. One of the other things I wanted to bring to bear in this conversation, Dan, and I didn't prep you for it because I wanted to hear your initial kind of knee jerk reaction to it, but I want, and call me a Neanderthal, tell me my knuckles are dragging, but I, I want that three fight limit modified. I do. I, I just I'm I'm looking at this time of the season, Dan. I'm I'm looking at guys who have reached it and and what happens to them once they have because they know they can't go anymore and other teams players know that these guys can't go anymore without being uh, subject to a suspension, etc. Again, I I think the game is in a good place. I I don't want us to go back, although. Boy, did I love watching Slapshot again on the weekend. Man, that's a fun movie to watch. But we don't need any of that nonsense. But we went from 10 to, did we go 10-6-3 or 10-5-3? Either way, we came down from the 10-fight limit in an awful hurry. And I, I just wonder if three might not be quite enough or if there's some sort of compromise we can find here. And and maybe maybe that becomes a conversation around eliminating fighting altogether, which I wouldn't endorse, but I just think we're in a, uh, I'm uncomfortable with the spot we're in at three game, at, at three fights for a season right now, or one every 22 or 23 games. Yeah, I agree. Cause I think the cool concept is you don't want these guys out there fighting every night. And I think you also don't want games devolving into gong shows, but I think there's other mechanisms because Players, coaches, teams always find workarounds. And what happens now is when you have a player at his three-fight limit, well, then they start negotiating which other player on my team is going to take the fight tonight. So you're still getting the fight just maybe from someone that shouldn't be or normally wouldn't. You've seen that a few times. So 
I think some of those other compromise tactics you're maybe talking about, Mike, or maybe maybe the limits on number of times you instigate, you get suspensions for that. Maybe the the limits on number of fights in a game. Once there's been three in a game, the next guys are gone. Maybe it's a team fight limit. You know, once the team hits whatever that number is, twenty in a year, they can no longer fight without suspensions. But there's there's workarounds or levels of complexity to this rule you could add in that make it a little bit more palatable because. The three fight limit, the problem I do have with it sometimes is once teams know a guy's at his three fight limit, then they start taking more liberties. And it, it there's a natural flow to these games that occurs that may, maybe not the intended result of the rule. So I'm with you that I think a little more built in flexibility could still achieve the spirit of what you're trying to achieve without some of this uh, extra stuff that's going on because of it. Love where you're coming from on many of those ideas. And I'll just add to it, too, how difficult it is on officials as if their job wasn't hard enough already. Just imagine being the guy in a critical game that has to decide whether or not a player was instigated upon, knowing that if you charge him with the instigator, then you're sending that team into a difficult spot with the suspension. Anyway, we'll leave it right there, but uh, I just, I, I like where you're coming from on a lot of that. All right, uh, we still have, oh my goodness gracious, uh, to talk about the comments made by Ben Boudreaux. Uh, if you didn't hear him, I think you're going to like him. I don't think his team liked him a whole lot, though, and I just want to make sure I get the name right. Our email coming from Owen, that's what I thought. I just wanted to double check. Uh, Owen sent us an email wanting to know how we feel about one of the teams in the Eastern Conference, which we will get to in just a moment. Also, our prospects of the week. we still got lots to come on this episode of the OHL podcast. Before I get into Ben Boudreaux's comments, Dan, I just want to uh, give a shout out. And look, I made this or took this goofy stand on my own. I, I haven't liked for two seasons what's going on in St. Catharines with the franchise ownership. It just doesn't strike me as being a really good look for the game right now, a really good fit for a development league considering all of the things that have been happening and, and frankly, the lack of success on the ice to show for it. But I do want to give acknowledgement and I think deservedly so to Ryan Rubrek, who has established a new franchise record, a franchise ice dogs record for goals by a 16 year old getting his 22nd on the weekend. Credit this kid for coming to a difficult situation when there was talk about him maybe exercising some influence and not only coming to it, but performing the way that he has this year as a rookie in St. Catharines. I think that's absolutely a positive for those fans. And we've talked about this a few times that on ice, there is enough to be positive about in Niagara. We try and ignore the sideshow that's occurred at times off ice. And we get frustrated with that. But on the ice, this team is not a lost cause. There's lots of work ethic there. There's lots of talent there. And Ryan Rubrik is at 16, 22 goals, uh, pacing to get close to 30 for the year. And then look out when that kid's 18 or 19. There's, and there's plenty of on ace reasons to be enthusiastic in St. Catharines. No question about it. I'd add Kevin He to the conversation as well, draft eligible, and we know he's going to make an NHL team very happy this June as well. To the comments then that precipitated this conversation, I got to credit uh, Greg Cowan with the Owen Sound Sun Times who posted it online and that's where it caught my attention but as we know it's been a another rough season on the ice for the Niagara Ice Dogs they're going to be hard pressed to hit 20 wins this season we'll uh, we'll see how things end up but nonetheless uh, after another loss up in Kingston and the Ice Dogs fell behind early a couple minutes in they're already down two and and I guess the coach realized that it's going to be a long night and by the end of the night he was no less frustrated and so Ben was quoted as having said, the best analogy I can say is I believe sometimes I feel like we're riding a donkey in a thoroughbred race. Every team we face is better, they're stronger, they're faster. Dan Mahar, over to you, coach. <laughs> Clearly, if you're a player on that team, those comments aren't going to sit terribly well. And I don't think they're going to sit terribly well if you're a scout on that team or the GM. So I think there's probably some ruffled feathers behind the scenes, but I got to admit as a, as a fan and distant observer, I love when coaches are, are colorful like this and, and just call it like it is. It, I know it reminds me of that often played clip from Michelle Terrian in his Pittsburgh Penguins days when 
he went before the the press room and said that he thought the goal of his defense corps was to be the worst defensive squad in the league. And that clip has been played over and over and over. And at the time, it talked about how he alienated his players. They didn't like it. But I recently heard uh, some of the players that were in the room back then talk laughing and saying, yeah, they, they, they felt targeted by that comment because they were they were pretty awful that year. Uh, but ha I, I think these things are called for the fun. Maybe they're a bit of a wake up call. Maybe hurts to hear when you're a player in that league and you think, well, does my coach not believe I'm good enough for this league? Does not believe I'm skilled enough? So you got to be really careful with the phrasing. But uh, the frustrations clearly boiled over into that comment. But you got to love it as a fan, don't you? You absolutely do. And obviously, uh, I love it as a member of the media. These are the kinds of quotes that we wait for. And I'm reluctant to draw too much more attention to them because the more attention I draw to them, the less likely I ever am to hear one again, right? But I, I love the honesty. And a, another former coach used to like to say, uh, you can't win the Kentucky Derby with a plow horse, right? So similar idea here. But where I, I struggle, and look, I, I'm sure heat of the moment, these are the sorts of things that happen. These are the frustration peaks, and this is what comes out. Where I struggle the most, though, frankly, for Ben Boudreaux himself and, and the hockey club is every team we face is better. They're stronger. They're faster. Like that, that just says that your team is incapable of competing in this league. And I, I, I don't know, like, I don't know how you go back into that room then and, and have the players want to go out there and go through a wall for you. Right. So it's tough. I, I love the honesty. I, I wish we had more of it. And and as I said, if I talk about it too much, we're, we're going to get less and less of this kind of honesty moving forward. But I, I go back to a, a classic from Harry Neal from way back when, you know, our team can't win on the road. Uh, we can't win at home. My failure as a coach is I can't find anywhere else for us to play. <laughs> there are so many uh, like that from the past. This one, this one will linger for a while, I believe, because Ben Boudreaux's only getting started. So, yeah, I'm always going to side with the guy with a sense of humor. So, if you come up with quips, quips like that for the media, I'm all in your court. You could make the argument it's good to keep those behind closed doors and give the same wake up call to your players by saying that. Maybe one of them will hear it, perk up, and try and prove you wrong, which I assume was probably his goal. But I like it better when they say it to us, Mike. Owen <laughs> sent us an email, which we encourage you to do anytime. And hey, if Ben Boudreaux wants to send an email and we can use anonymous coaching quotes, we're happy to do that too. Uh, but do send emails anytime. OHL podcast at rogers.com. Owen's email. Hey gents, I wanted to ask you guys your thoughts on the North Bay battalion this year. What do you think their potential is? Where do they sit in your eyes? And what do you think of the tank they skate out of? Owen, thanks for the email. Not sure where you're going with that last part of the question, but we will address all points therein. Dan Mahar, what's your take on the North Bay Battalion this year? Well, I think the North Bay Battalion are criminally underrated. They have been for a while. One of the most underrated teams in the league again. I, I think, I can't remember where you had him, Mike. I had him right near the top of the conference going in. I thought they just had too much talent returning. And then they added to it as we saw at the trade deadline plucking three pretty nice pieces off of the Sarnia Sting. I, I don't know if I want to touch the tank. I love those. I love those gimmicks. I love, you know, it's, it's for the kids, right? So they, they see that tank coming out. Maybe one day they want to skate through that tank. So I think I, I'm all for those gimmicks, Owen, but for your namesake, Owen, I'm just going to say, I don't know, Mike, this is a question for you. I, are there two more underrated players in this league than Owen Van Steensel and Dallin Wakely? Just, continuing to plow well over a point a game show up every night there's a physicality especially in Wakely's game getting to the net front I think these are just dynamic players that you don't hear a whole lot about when you have players like that flying under the radar on your team a team that's already got Sandusville Manis had a goal a game since he's come over you got Anthony Romani right at the top of the league scoring Kitchener kid Justin Ertl is <laughs> keeping up his point per game pace and being a net front presence as always. And you, the, you can go down the list about how deep that team is, but I think I, I should stop and let you answer that question though about Ben Steensel and, and Wakely. Can you think of two more underrated forwards in this league? Off the top of my head, I would be hard pressed. I had Wakely kind of on my list of 
names to mention as we had this conversation about North Bay, because when I'm forced to take a closer look for a moment and just consider what the battalion have to offer, he's a guy that jumps out at me for the reasons you mentioned. I think it's an excellent point on Van Steensel as well. And it probably, watching these guys do what they do, speaks to the team first approach that they're playing up there, that they've got up there under Ryan Ulihan, And of course, Adam Dennis is the GM. It is it is an impressive hockey club. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I didn't go back to see where I had picked them initially. But when the trade deadline came around this year, I, I had a feeling that it was going to be a sell-off in North Bay, that they were going to say, look, we, we had our run last year. We came up a little short. It's time for us to restock, recalibrate, and get ready for the next run. They didn't do that. You already mentioned the returns that they're getting, and they have been impressive. Vilmanis at 24 points in 19 games. Andrew LeBlanc, 16 points in 19, both trending above where they had been prior to arrival in North Bay. And then you've got Jacob LeBlanc. His point totals are down, but he's gone from a minus 10 in Sarnia to a plus 11 with North Bay. And overall, the points he's put up are trending above his career average. So you got to like the deals that were made there and how they've strengthened a team that I believe when I look at it now feels as though it's still got something to prove. They fell short last year. Well, look on any given day in the Eastern conference, I, I think you can, if you had four coins to flip and, and I, I did a random sampling of Eastern Conference guys here and and coaches just to check in and get the sense of how people felt. And North Bay's name came up an awful lot as a team that gives them a little bit of jitters as the playoffs approach. You've got Dom DiVincentis in goal, so just start there. Ty Nelson, an absolute stud on defense, and then we can go down all the other things we've just talked about. So to directly answer your question, Owen, what our take is on the North Bay Battalion, I would suggest that they have as good a chance as any team in the East as coming out of the conference this year. I was just going to say the exact same thing. Like to answer Owen's original question, you ask what their potential is. I think they could win this whole conference. I think, will they? I don't know, but they're as good a chance as anyone. And and you, we went down that whole list of forwards, Mike, and we had, you're right, you we hadn't even mentioned Dom DiVincentis in net, as good as any goalie in this league. Ty Nelson, another point-a-game defenseman, running uh, Jacob LeBlanc on defense, running 40, mid-40s in points already. So you got a lot of offensive potency on the back end. And we didn't even mention one of my favorite players in this league, a guy I loved when I saw in the Don Mills Flyers, Paul Christopoulos, a rock back on D, uh, a veteran player in this league now. And then they picked up a guy like Bronson Wright as well at the trade deadline, Mike, and that's a big... It literally and figuratively add to that back end they're not easy to score on they can score a ton and when you can say that about any team how can they not be considered a, a key contender so i think if you ask me to put money on any team right now I, I my first answer would be no but my second answer might be north bay so my answer is going to be absolutely the same because you got north bay you got brantford you got sudbury you got oshawa do you ever ignore ottawa no, and that's only five teams where I, I just think it's so wide open still in the East. So, Owen, I'm assuming you're a battalion fan. Maybe you're from North Bay, beautiful city, the bridge to the north up there. And hey, uh, enjoy it because I think the battalion has as good a chance as any in the Eastern Conference to represent that side. And then if Saginaw ends up representing the West, oh, lo and behold, you might be able to punch a ticket to the dance even just for showing up to the OHL final. So we'll see how that goes on, on the question about the tank. And Dan, you touched on it and I like your diplomatic approach to this. You're not wrong. Look, there, there is a former version of me that would be far more bombastic, loud for the sake of being loud. And, and I would, you know, start picking nits all over the place. Generally speaking, um, is it a little bit cheesy, gimmicky? Sure. One minute to cease fire before the, like in the final minute of play of a period. Oh my goodness gracious. The tank, they skate up, whatever. But so what? But that's, it's really good. Although I don't know that I would mind something different because in Sault Ste. Marie, for example, there used to be an inflatable 
greyhound, allegedly a greyhound that the team skated out of. It looked more to me like a rat than a dog. They have upgraded. So maybe at some point, I don't know though how you change if your team name is the battalion from a tank and keep Sarge as your mascot and and do one minute to cease fire. I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna get in your way of doing that because cheesy as it might be. I do, though, remember a time, and this is back when the team was still in Brampton, and I was working alongside uh, my mentor in this business and a man that meant so much to me as a young broadcaster, and I got a chance to work with him for about a decade, and it was just an incredible experience for me. So just imagine me alongside a man I have admired my whole life who meant a ton to me without even directly trying to influence my career. I just learned so much from him. I get the chance to work alongside him and I'm, I'm trying hard to not fanboy over my broadcast partner. And we're in Brampton and I just happened to look towards that corner of the ice as the inflatable was being deflated. And I think you know where I'm going with this. I mean, let's be honest. I'll just put it out there. It's as phallic as it gets. And the turret just, I mean, Guy Lafleur needs to do a commercial for that turret, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, it's it's corny, Owen, but it's North Bay's. And just uh, just keep it up. If if the kids and or the broadcasters giggle at the sign of the turret deflating, then or inflating, for that matter, then, then so be it. Uh, juvenile as charged over here. <laughs> I was just going to say, Mike, it's no better inflating. So that was my only <laughs> comment. <laughs> uh, real quick, I wanted to touch on, uh, because I mentioned Saginaw, and you might remember, I, I know I said this because I caught a little bit of flack for so doing, but I said, look, the way this team is shaping up, how good they were last year, Memorial Cup host, blah, 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 50 wins should not be out of the question, out of the realm of possibility for the Saginaw spirit. I, 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 taken a little bit of heat. I've been reminded of that from time to time since the beginning of the season. Never did I ever think that it would have been London perhaps winning the race to 50 wins when I said that at the beginning of the season. But Saginaw Spirit have to go 9-2 and two over their final 11 to make me a winner if I had placed a bet in that category, which just goes to show, in my opinion, that 50 wins is an awfully difficult target to achieve. When you have to put up numbers like that, as good a season as they've had and still needing to go nine and two, 50 wins is no joke in a 68 game season. So the fact that anyone's even approaching that is, is pretty fantastic. And to have two teams kind of flirting with it is, is incredible. So that's, that's consistency at its core. And we see how good this league is, Mike. So it's not easy to do in any year. No question about that. Okay. Let's get to our prospects of the week. As we always like to do, as we wrap up an episode, who you got for us this week, Dansky? Well, I'm going to go to a team that season hasn't gone quite as well as they had hoped and quite as well as I had predicted it would. But uh, a guy who I think is really just bringing it every night and more so since the turn of the calendar is Riley Patterson and Barry. He's my guy this week. I think you look, the point totals are there, basically a point a game as a draft eligible forward who, who came to Barry in the trade in the offseason. Uh, plus side of the ledger on a team where you're not getting a whole lot of that, a team that traded off some assets at the trade deadline and went with a pretty young roster. He's continuing to bring it more and more. And I know that scouts are noticing what Riley Patterson's doing in, in Barry. So I expect again, another bright spot in a, in an otherwise not great season in Barry, but uh, needs a shout out for, for how well he's been playing in 2024. Who have you got? I am not going to go nearly as deep. Uh, I think I'm taking the obvious route here, although I am going to throw in an honorable mention just for the hell of it. But Liam Greentree is my guy this week. That, that Windsor-Guelph game on Friday night of this past weekend was as wild as you'll get in this league. And I'm sorry to any fans in Guelph, but ick the way that one ended. The storm with a 7-4 lead with about five minutes to play and they could not hold it. They could not slow down the Ryan Abraham and Liam Greentree Express. Greentree, of course, then becomes my prospect of the week. A goal and three assists just in that game versus Guelph. He picks up another assist uh, in the loss to Owen Sound the next night. But what a weekend it was for Greentree. What a game that was for Windsor. And what a night to forget on the opposite side of the ledger for the Guelph Storm. Eesh, that's a, that's a tough one to swallow if you're Guelph. 
Well, Green Tree could probably be in the conversation every week. He's been not good exactly. all year. Yeah. But in terms of the Guelph, just on the Guelph point, Mike, last week we called them for not scoring enough goals. Then if they're going to be successful, they're going to have to score more goals. They said, okay, we'll go out and do that. They forgot about the other end this time, though. So you got to do both ends, Guelph. I'm sorry. There's no shortcuts to success in this league. <laughs> and just to tie a bow on that Green Tree prospect of the week, a, a buddy of mine from Guelph, shout out to uh, Mike Shear and the family. I want to say that because uh, Mike's son, Logan, is a childhood cancer survivor. And the Shear family has gotten very involved from the time Logan was sick uh, to today in fundraising for Ronald McDonald House, which helped them a lot for childhood cancer charities, et cetera. Uh, Logan's dad, or Logan's grandfather, Dennis, writes children's books under the Yellow Moon Mouse publishing banner and does it for charitable causes. So it's it's a really cool story. I just wanted to add the Sheer family story into this. If you're in and around the Guelph area, you probably know that. Anyway, Mikey was headed to the game in Guelph on Friday night and texted me and said, who should I watch out for on this Windsor team? I said, keep your eye on Liam Greentree. And so then Greentree grows out, goes out and has a, a four-point night. I just wanted to add the Sheer story into that. But see, I, it was like I was calling him even before. As you said, he could be a prospect of the week any week, the way he's been playing. I wanted to add, because while Mike Shear was enjoying that game in Guelph last Friday, I was watching the Rangers and the Sarnia Sting, and I wanted to give honorable mention. And look, this is a one-off. I, I saw him for one game. He's not on anybody's radar. I'm not telling you he's going to go in any of the seven rounds uh, this summer to the National Hockey League, but ding dang it. Did I like Dennis Lomanak's game for the Sarnia Sting on Friday night? Comes in as a free agent last year, having played with CompuWare uh, AAA U16 team in Michigan. And I don't know, there was just something like he was physical. He, he his gas meter, his give a, you know, what meter was on full from what I could see playing for a team that's going to be like live and die to make the playoffs this year. They might end up missing, but Full effort, feisty, got into a spirited fight in that game. I'm like, who's this Lomanac kid? Again, maybe a one-off, but if Alan Latang's not loving his uh, his kid named Lomanac, I don't know. That was a, I thought it was a really nice 60 minutes from the kid. He gives up a little bit of size in most of those battles too, and no fear. Uh, just was going at it all night, and you love to see it when you're when your team's down near the bottom of the standings, fighting for their playoff lives. That's the kind of bite back you need, and and a lot of teams don't get it, so. Make yourself noticed, kid. He did it. He certainly did. I mentioned earlier in this episode that a feature interview is coming back this Friday. I'm really happy to be able to share it with you. Uh, I already alluded to some of the fun stories about 500 bucks and a bottle of Jack to do this, that, or the other thing to a player on the other team. Memorial Cup champion with Niagara Falls uh, more than 50 years ago. Put it to you this way. If you want old school, you are going to get the oldest of the old school with this interview on the OHL podcast on Friday. Uh, our guest has stories to spare and they are a riot. So I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I did when we put it together. And remember, Owen sent an email this week, wanted to know what we thought of North Bay. Any questions you've got, comments or feedback, send it to ohlpodcast at rogers.com. Uh, Dan, I'm sure we're going to agree. Wouldn't it be nice next week if we could not talk about bounties, investigations, court cases, et cetera. Maybe, just maybe, as the playoffs are right around the corner, we could talk about things on the ice <laughs> next week. Yeah, let's keep it all positive. Let's have an all-positive pod next week. How about that? I like all positive pods, so we'll try to aim for that. Hey, OHL and the 20 member clubs, it's up to you to deliver that for us. He is Dan Mahar. Find him on Twitter at his name, Dan Mahar. I'm Mike Farwell at Farwell underscore OHL. Thanks for listening to the OHL podcast.